Welcome back to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. This episode will be shorter than my usual in-depth discussions uh, because today I just want to talk about the latest episode of 24 Legacy Hours 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. that premiered last Monday. And I want to frankly discuss how disappointed I was with this particular show, especially in light of the return of an iconic character from the original 24 series, Tony Almeida. Now, I will warn you out of courtesy that there will be spoilers in this episode. So if you have not seen the latest uh, episode of 24 Legacy, uh, please feel free to turn this off and wait until you have had an opportune time to watch. Or if you want to go forward, then we'll go forward. And let's talk about my displeasure with our 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. First, let's begin, however, by talking about a character that I thought was going to play a more central role in the program, but who so far uh, seems to have been sidelined in favor of another individual. I'm referring to Mariana Stiles. Now, since the beginning of this new series, Mariana was touted to us as perhaps the brilliant successor to her cousin, Edgar Stiles the former CTU computer analyst who was killed in the fifth season of the original 24. She was made to appear as an individual of certain hidden but apparently precocious talent in computer programming, talent that was suggested could potentially and maybe even eventually run circles around her superior Andy Shalowitz. Now, however, after the first two episodes, Mariana Stiles has, has been virtually pushed back into the margins of the show. Whatever latent genius she may have appeared to have possessed in the first two hours of Legacy has been marginalized so that the skills and experience of Shallowitz can be played up. And that's fine, but whatever groundwork was being laid to highlight Mariana has basically since disappeared, dropped off the map. And I'm wondering just what this character's purpose is supposed to be in light of the effort that was originally undertaken to give her so much potential and to make us be interested in her character, only to now see her basically shoved into the background of, the, of a scene and, if she's lucky at all, given only a handful of lines to say. So that's my uh, look at Mariana Stiles, and I'm wondering where she's going as a character on the whole, and I hope maybe something's going to happen with her because she was given all this play at the beginning and you know tying her into Edgar Stiles was meant to obviously uh, make us like her to some degree uh, so I don't know what's up with her we'll see I guess now my second gripe with this particular episode was that it was really just too lovey-dovey for me I mean we were focusing quite a bit on a number of relationships in this hour from Andy Shalowitz and his boyfriend Thomas Locke and their on again off again rocky relationship to Isaac professing his undying love for Nicole and telling her that she made the right choice in choosing his brother Eric over him, to the past romance between Rebecca Ingram and Tony Almeida that was revealed in the latter part of the show, to the jealousy that was expressed by Tony's new bad girl girlfriend Cedra when she realized that Tony and Rebecca had a past and she wanted to know if Tony was getting involved, getting them involved in this operation against Henry Donovan because of that because of his relationship with Rebecca, former relationship that is, to even uh, Eric and Nicole at the end of the show when he was uh, about to try and take down Jadala bin Khalid and Eric declares how much he loves Nicole and then Nicole goes bonkers at the notion that Eric would sacrifice himself for a cause greater than his personal benefit, possibly leaving her alone and certainly uh, possibly uh, making that the final time that they would see one another and ending that relationship. I mean, this went on and on and was dispersed throughout the episode so much so that to me, it took up some 40% of the show altogether. Maybe more, maybe less, but it was certainly a very significant portion of the show, all of these relationship angles that were going on. And after a while, I really began to get so annoyed that I had to just ask myself, is this going to be 24 for the touchy-feely generation or what? Seriously. I mean, I do appreciate that they are trying to distinguish 24 Legacy from the original 24, but honestly, I have to say that this episode didn't just bore me, it was tedious and tiresome to watch. So tiresome that I had to force myself to keep going, and that is a poor sign. I understand 
that relationships are uh, that the relationship angles are things that are fundamental to character development and I don't object to that I do object however to it taking up so much of the show that nothing else of significance really got the focus that it deserved they focus on Eric's efforts to try to take down Jadala bin Khalid by using Andy Shalowitz and the pretense that they were actually going to try to fix the flash drive. The uh, more serious aspects of what was going on between Henry Donovan and Tony Almeida and Rebecca Ingram, where they were going to torture him effectively to get him to admit that he actually helped Jadala Ben Khaled's people get to Eric Carter's Ranger unit. The more important aspects of the show that were going on when Senator John Donovan found out that his father was missing and he found out from his wife that she had his father at a black site and that she was possibly going to torture him for information. All of that stuff got marginalized and pushed to the side in favor of all of, of, in favor of, all of these big relationship stuff. And it really just got uh, totally annoying after a point. And I was really ready to turn the episode off and quit watching it altogether. Furthermore, as relates to Tony Almeida, there were some things that just did not get explained in this program that should have been. Things, again, that to me that could have been more important than uh, spending minute after minute after minute after minute after minute on all of these relationship stuff. First of all, how did Tony Almeida get released from a maximum security prison or how did he escape from a maximum security federal prison without a manhunt from the government being unleashed upon him? When did he and Rebecca Ingram meet and under what circumstances did they meet after the death of Michelle Dessler, Tony's deceased wife from the original 24? None of these questions were satisfactorily explained, even with the short that they did that's out on the internet right now showing how Tony escaped from prison. That could have received a lot more explanation and, and expository than it did, and yet it even didn't even get touched on because we want to take the time to talk about um, you know, him and Rebecca and his jealous girlfriend, Cedra. We want to take the time to talk about Isaac's undying love for Nicole and how she made the right choice in choosing his brother over him, etc., etc. Now, I say the things I'm saying with some small amount of unease because I really wanted to enjoy this hour, and I was looking forward to it especially with the return of an iconic and pivotal character like Tony Almeida, and sadly, I was sorely disappointed. And speaking of Tony's return, when he finally comes on the scene, he's barely used for anything but filling in screen time. I mean, it's like, hi, Rebecca, long time no see. Yes, yeah, Cedra, me and Rebecca had a fling once, but don't worry about it. And hey, Mr. Donovan, I'm going to bore you to death with threats about what I'm going to do to you if you don't tell me what I want to know, but I'm not actually going to do anything to you. I mean, the most exciting thing that happened in this episode was that knockout gas attack that Tony, Tony hit Donovan's car with earlier in the show. That's it. So I really didn't feel this show at all, and it grew really, really, really tedious to watch all the way around. Now, the other thing that struck me about this episode, which gets back to this touchy-feely stuff that I was mentioning before, was this interplay between Andy Shalowitz and his boyfriend Thomas Locke. Now, we see at various points in the show that Shalowitz is apparently a very clingy, needy, whiny, and insecure individual, things that he readily admitted to earlier in the program. But even seeing him admit to it did not take the bad taste out of my mouth that I had for him because he really seemed to me to be someone who lacked self-control and self-mastery over his, his own emotions. Something that really turns me off when I observe it in people. But even so, having, having to sit and watch what amounted to minute after minute of, after minute of this nonsense was monotonous and it became odious at some point for me in the show. Now, I suppose this is how Andy Shalowitz is going to be played throughout the program. But honestly, if that's what's going to happen, if this is going to keep up, just like as he was doing in this show, if this is what's going to happen, I was really hoping that Jadala bin Khalid would just shoot the guy. And, and I mean just shoot him and get it over with. And if Andy Shalowitz does continue to be this kind of whiny piece of flotsam in the show, then I'm really rooting for even more for his death as soon as possible. Seriously, straight up, no nonsense. Now, the other thing that got me uh, was the dialogue between Jadala bin Khalid and Nicole Carter. This scene, to me, was stale, it was banal, it was boring, and it was menial to me. 
to listen to how these two talked to and interacted with one another. When I watched Nicole's responses to Jadala bin Khalid in the show, I could not help but sink into a morass of depression. And I want you to listen to some examples of what I mean. It's horrifying, isn't it? Of course it is. It's disgusting. But if you think this will make Eric do what you want, you're wrong. Oh, but he will, though. He will because he loves you. And once he's done, I'll kill him. You can try. But you better not miss. Because I promise you. He won't. Now, it's disgusting. That's the best she could say. I mean, for God's sake, woman, you are in the presence of one of the greatest, wannabe anyway, terrorist masterminds of our time, and the best you can say is, you better not miss because my husband won't. How many times have we heard this kind of trivial, menial dialogue in the past? I mean, for crying out loud, I'm not looking for Shakespeare here, people, and I understand that Nicole Carter is not anyone special. She's an average, everyday girl thrust into extraordinary circumstances. But for God's sake, writing team, do something to make this chick stand out a little more than that, especially in the presence of the main fracking villain of the story. And speaking of Jadala bin Khalid, next gripe. <sighs> wow, I, I just can't get over how much I could, could not stand this episode. Speaking of Jadala bin Khalid, I realize that Mr. Bin Khalid is playing the long game, okay? And he's playing the long game because he wants all 15, now, fifth, now 14 actually, of his sleeper cells to attack at once, simultaneously, as was his father's original plan, which is, a, in my opinion, a brilliant, far-reaching, and far-seeing plan. But Jadala bin Khalid is also playing the long game because he's looking down the road, not just to the attacks themselves, but what impact they will have on American society, on American policy in the Middle East, and, in a broader sense, what impact they'll have on the West as a whole toward the Arab Muslim world. In other words, Jadala bin Khalid is not just trying to make one short-sighted and short-range statement that will last the next five years and be forgotten. He is trying to make a long-range, far-sighted statement that will last the next hundred years and be remembered, not just by the West, but by the world. He wants to show the world just how weak the West is and just how demoralized its resolve to lead the world has become. That's great! It's brilliant character traits that, will make, that make up the most classic megalomaniacal villains that you've seen in, in many types of programs. It's, it's great for drama, it's great for character development, it's great for the long-range outreach of any kind of show of 24 Legacies type. But I also have to confess to you that I am a bit underwhelmed by Jadala bin Khalid because as an adversary of weight, he's just not living up to what I'm expecting. His execution of his father's plan, for example, to this point has been nothing but the result of an accident. A rebellious action by one of his men who later paid the supreme price for, de for defying Jadala bin Khalid's authority. And this does make me wonder, by the way, if Jadala bin Khalid really has the charisma, the power, and the intelligence to lead his men to victory. To make his men want to follow him even into the jaws of death itself. Or if he's just piggybacking off his father's persona, if he's nothing more than a pale shadow of what his father, Ibrahim bin Khalid, once was. I mean, to me, Jadala bin Khalid comes off less like a sophisticated, intimidating, mature, and impactful terrorist, and more like an indecisive, wishy-washy man who cannot decide how to deal effectively with people who resist him. He hesitates too long, in my opinion. And maybe this takes time to develop perhaps so I'm willing to give him and I was willing to give him the opportunity to make me both fear and respect him neither of which however at this point I am doing case in point 
At the end of the hour, Eric confronts Jadallah bin Khalid and it with Andy Shalowitz in tow, right? And at this point, Eric, Nicole, and his brother Isaac go on and on and on and on and on in this emotional, can't shut up, won't quit whining exchange that lasts for what seems like forever, while Jadallah bin Khalid stands there yelling out, I'm waiting, Mr. Carter, with his hands folded in front of himself. Okay? And then even after they leave, Carter still continues to test Jadala by not immediately handing over Shalowitz. Now, at this point, honestly, I was expecting somebody to get shot. Seriously. I mean, come on, y'all. At what point does Jadala stop patiently having his hands folded in front of himself and say, Look, this is not a game. I'm not playing with you. I mean business when I'm talking, and you will quit defying me or somebody is going to die right here, right now. I mean, I fully expected Isaac Carter to get shot in the head. No ifs, ands, or buts. Instead, he and Nicole drive off and Jadala bin Khalid and Eric continue standing there pointing guns at each other for the last five minutes of the program. And it all ends on a cliffhanger with Andy Shalowitz giving this weak little sissified protest. Carter! Oh, for God's sake. Oh, man. I'm sorry to say it. And some of you may disagree. And that's fine. But I'm sorry to say it, but our six sucked. It sucked. And what I expected to see, not that I expect 24 Legacy to be a clone of the original 24, but they're obviously taking heavy advantage of the original template. But like a poor marksman, they keep missing the target and keep failing to use the template effectively. What is up with this 24 Legacy? By now, I expected this program to be deep into the action, deep into the conspiracy, and by now, I expected some serious casualties, especially since there are only 12 episodes for the season, seven of which we've already watched. I don't know what the deal is here, folks, and I don't know what the ratings are, but I'll tell you this. If things keep going like this, I'm highly dubious that this show will get a second season unless it is heavily subsidized by Fox. And I, personally, am highly doubtful that I'll return for the second year, even if it is renewed, if it does not vastly improve upon what is happening now. This was just too whack to accept. Seriously. You had the return of a beloved character like Tony Almeida, and even then, even then, they failed miserably to capitalize, to capitalize on it with the kind of gusto that somebody like him demands. Well, I hope hours 7 through 8 makes me feel better about what I saw last week because I'm really on the verge of dropping up. I am. And that's not something I wanted to say and it's not something I want to do. Now, I was inspired to, to do uh, a review of this episode because I was just so thoroughly displeased and disgusted with it. Normally, I will not do regular hour by hour or episode by episode reviews of 24 Legacy. I will wait and do a group of them at a time, but because this one just made me so mad, I decided to go ahead and get this one off my chest right away. So unless uh, hour seven through eight really stands out positively or negatively, I will be waiting to do a review of that, possibly waiting to do a review to the end of the season. And uh, otherwise, we'll see. So, I guess, until next time, 24 fans, live another day.